Welcome to part 5 of Depraved by Brian Smith. So, I'm going on day 16 of this work assignment, and emotionally, I want to cuddle a pine cone. Considering I have 8 hours left of this book, technically I'm still at the very beginning of it, but every single chapter now, um, for our point of view of each of our main characters, there is an SA scene at every single chapter now. Physical assault bothers me, um, internally, but I'm able to kind of block it out. It's a little harder when the narrator of the book really deeply describes the scenes, so if that really bothers you, I wouldn't recommend listening to the book, but it is really fast-paced and it's really good so far, but I will <laughs> be very vague about the scenes for you. Also, I found a bunch of bumblebees sleeping on a plant, so I'm gonna go, we're gonna go look at them. So our chapter opens up with Megan's perspective. Megan was dating Pete, and they stopped at the gas station, if you remember. Uh, Pete was taken in the van, and they drove down this long dirt road. Megan is walking down that dirt road to find Pete. And as she's walking, she is going through this mental monologue and picturing killing those men that took her beloved boyfriend, Pete. And as she's walking, she found an abandoned ID of a female. Her name was Michelle. She looked very similar to Megan. And it, from the looks of the wallet, it looked pretty fresh. Little did Megan know, in her time of uh, glancing over this ID, she noticed that a car was coming up behind her. She kind of freaked out, but as she turned around to look, a Hopkins Bend Sheriff pulled up right behind her. He got out, and uh, she thought, "Oh my God, I'm saved! It's gonna, I'm gonna get Pete back." Uh, she started crying, and he's like, "It's all right, little lady. Just tell me what happened." And she broke down, and she told him everything. Oh, oh, you're talking about the Preston boys? I took your, took your man. You see. Uh, the Preston boys, they have a first-rate reputation here. It's a little hard to believe that they did what you said they done. Matter of fact, sounds like crazy talk to me. Ma'am, are you on drugs? Megan stopped, bewildered, and... What? No, I'm not on drugs. I, I need help. I need you to find Pete. The officer immediately flexed his power and his leg, pulled out his gun, threatened her, and told her to step to the vehicle to be patted down. And of course, a dirty small town cop, he felt her up and found the ID of missing girl Michelle in Megan's pocket. Huh. I got you now, bitch. This girl Michelle, she's been missing a long time. I'm gonna have to arrest you for suspicion for kidnapping and murder. Megan freaked out, of course, more crying, more yelling, pleading. What are you doing? I don't understand. I didn't do anything. I found it on the road. I'm trying to look for Pete. Y you have to understand. But he wasn't gonna listen. He threw her in the back of the cop car and began driving the opposite way down the dirt road to go into town. Dirty small town cop named Hal driving the vehicle, he looked back at the uh, crying Megan in the back seat and said, don't worry about those federal and state charges of murder and kidnapping out here. We believe the local law knows best. Giggled to himself. Ick. And now the chapter switches point of views to Pete where Pete woke up in the van with one of the dirty men sitting on his back. So, uh, I just took a pee-pee break a little bit ago, um, on that side of the road. Uh, I'm over here right now. This is where I'm walking. And over there is a mama bear with two babies, uh, black bears. Um, so they're going to stay over there. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be over here and, uh, let's keep it that way. So, uh, my pee-pee break almost became a poo-poo break, but... <laughs> So as Pete regained consciousness inside the van with one of the dirty men sitting on his back, he vaguely remembered a 
SA assault happening to him as he was unconscious in the gas station. He was in and out of consciousness at that time. He started wiggling around and the men noticed he was stirring a bit. Hey, Gil. Looks like the boar's awake. Where are you taking me? That ain't none your concern, bitch. And at that time, they arrived in an unknown location. They forced Pete out of the van. There was a ranch-style house. Their mother, Carl and Gil, the two plaid men in overalls and beards and whatever, a large woman covered in tattoos met them at the door. Look, ma, we got another one for the holiday feast, the woman said. Put it out back with the others. Eyed him up and down and stared longingly at Pete's body. Ew. As they went around the side of this ranch-style house, there were big cages filled with all kinds of different large dogs. Pit bulls, German shepherds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, and they all looked feral. These were hunting dogs. And as they neared another cage with a naked woman locked inside, they forced Pete into this cage with the woman. He fought back, and of course they beat the crap out of him to get him in the cage. And at this time, we switch perspectives to Jessica as she held the gun to an innocent civilian, the cabin she walked up in in the forest clearing. She planned to steal the truck from this old man sitting on his porch. As she held the rifle to this man's face, she asked, You ain't no Amish, are you? Uh, no ma'am. Good. I don't want to kill no peace-loving Amish folk. Uh, okay. 